So thank you all for coming to this basement classroom on what is really a quintessentially beautiful Upper Valley Day, I have to say. I appreciate you coming out for it. Uh, and it's really my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Kevin Schultz is a professor at the University of Illinois Chicago campus, where he teaches classes in 20th century U.S. of religious history, ethnic history, cultural and intellectual history are his uh, specialties. Um, he wrote a really wonderful first book called Tri-Faith America, How Post-War Catholics and Jews Held America to Its Protestant Promise. That was published by Oxford University Press in 2011. It's a really wonderful book that examines the way America goes from embracing itself as a Christian nation to a, a Judeo-Christian nation in which Catholics, Jews, and uh, Protestants are, are sort of a, a tri uh, It looks at students in the Roman Institute, it looks at fraternities as one of the sites of this um, assimilation or multicultural. It's pretty fascinating. In a census, it looks at lots of different sites for this. Um, I met Kevin at a conference last fall. We were on a book prize committee together, and we happened to run into in each other at Starbucks, which is what you do at the conference, I suppose, in the hotel lobby. And we ended up having a, a conversation. He had just received the cover art. I don't know if you remember this, but he just received the cover art for the book. And we talked about the book a little bit, and I thought it sounded like a really fun way to teach the 60s, which I find very hard to teach because it's hard to, I teach intellectual history, it's hard to choose a text or two texts to speak to the 60s. Is it Baldwin? Is it, you know, is it Betty Friedan? What's the, what's the one text I can teach that week that will help us make sense of the 60s? It's a, it's a, a difficult problem, in particular in that decade, I find. Um, so I'd asked him, is this a good book to teach to undergrads? And he said, yes, it is. It's written for a, a broad audience. Um, the undergraduates will tell us uh, in a couple weeks. I will get, you know, ask me, I'll let you know. Some of them have already started they can tell you. Um, but it, was, it came out just in time. It was published in June. Here it is, the visual display. Uh, Buckley Mailer, Biblical Friendship that Shaped the 60s, uh, published by Norton. It will be on sale if you're interested in buying a copy. Uh, Norwich Bookstore has, um, has put up a table for us outside the selling books, so if you're interested in buying it and having uh, Kevin sign it for you, please do so after the talk, he'd be happy to do that. Um, anyway, so it just came out in, in June to very wide um, publicity, it's been reviewed everywhere. Very good timing for History 21, which I'm sure Norton was very sensitive to our deadlines at Dartmouth, so thank you for, for that, Norton. Um, and I think you know, Kevin will be happy to take questions after the talk, so we'll hear from him and then uh, be happy to hear from you as well. So thank you and join me in welcoming Kevin Schultz. Thank you, Leslie, for inviting me and thank you to the History Department for having me out here. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and thank you all. Um, I know some of you are forced to be here, so I appreciate your teacher being here. <laughs> but the rest of the community members, it's a beautiful day outside. You can be in kettle corn and listen to music, and you're here. So thank you very much. I'll try to outdo the kettle corn in the sunshine. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So my name is Kevin Schultz, and I was invited, as, as Leslie said, Christian Butler said, to talk about my book, Buckley and Mailer. Um, and if you'll indulge me for a second, I'd like to start out by uh, reading just the, some parts of this, of this letter that I found from 1965. It's actually the letter that started the whole project for me. It, the, it's the letter that taught me that these two guys, um, this radical lefty and this sort of conservative right-winger, were friends. And more than that, that this particular friendship um, might hold the key to understanding much of what happened in the 1960s. Um, sounds like a lot, probably, but bear with me just for a moment. I'm going to disagree with you later. Dear Bill, wrote Norman Mailer in 1965, I write you this letter in great envy. I think you are finally going to displace me as the most hated man in American life. <laughs> and of course that position is bearable only if one is number one. To be the second most hated man in the picture will probably prove to be a little like working behind a mule for years. Cleaning, cleaning up, you guys get it, right? <laughs> Buckley almost certainly laughed at this line, as he did from do dozens of other lines that Norman Mailer sent him over the years of their, of their friendship. But this letter had a lot more substance to it than a lot of the other letters. For this letter was sent to William F. Buckley, Jr., just days after he gave a speech to a bunch of New York City cops, trying to prop them up in the aftermath of the hot summer riots. 
um, and he tried to do this by defending the actions of the police at Selma, Alabama, of all places. Now, many of us here have probably seen the film Selma, and we know that the actions of the police are basically indefensible. If historians have complained about the atrocious way that that film portrayed LBJ, nobody's really said the film got the actions of the police wrong, and only Bill Buckley tried to defend them, really. And he was killer in the press. He was so upset at the press coming down on him that he found out that the speech in which he talked about the cops of Selma had been recorded. And so he went and got the tape recording from, from the uh, venue that had, had, had uh, hosted him, and he called a press conference without ever having listened to the tape, sort of like this. All the press was there. He, was, uh, he had a staffer from his magazine, National Review, go and pick up the tape. The staffer runs in and realizes the room is totally full, all these microphones are pouring in his face. He puts the tape in, nobody listened to the tape, and he hits play, and they listen to the talk. And sure enough, right when Buckley is building up to the auspicious part about, the inauspicious part about Selma, the tape player breaks. And everybody leans in, and he pushes the button, and everybody leans in. One of the television guys comes and tries to help him, and they fix it sort of, they have to piece it back together, and they play it through, and there's a mysterious missing minute. <laughs> and it was that minute where he talked about Selma. Um, it all looked a little suspicious, and all the newspapers just drew blood. The New York Times, the New York Post. Buckley was en route to, in fact, becoming the most hated man in America. I mean, defending the cops at Selma, right? But then that letter goes on. This is still the first letter. After, fending, after spending a few pages discussing the errors that Buckley had made, and also what the press had gotten wrong in its denunciation of him, Mailer concluded this letter, the whole thing that kicked it off for me, like this. Listen, I wish I could do a really good Mailer, right? Listen, right? Um, I think our public debating days are probably over, for a time at least. As wrestlers, we are now both villains, and that excites no proper passions. Still, it may open something interesting, which is that the two of us have a long, careful, private discussion one night because I think in all modesty, there's much in your thought which is innocent of its own implications, and there's much surplus in mine which could profitably be sliced away by the powers of your logic. And here's Mailer in some ways trying to save William F. Buckley Jr., and trying to save his conservatism from devolving into sort of the ugly law and order kind of conservatism. And he's also acknowledging the fact that his version of left-wing liberalism uh, has a penchant for Pollyannism and could profitably be sliced away by Buckley's logic. You don't see that too often among heavyweight intellectuals. <coughs> and then he signed the letter, Incorrigibly Yours, Darwin. Right? That was almost the title of the book, Incorrigibly Yours. I thought that was a great one. Right? Yeah. Uh, no. uh, I tried. I tried hard. Well, of course, as he always did, Buckley writes back immediately to this letter, Thank you for your warm and amusing letter. And anyway, I have a lot more to teach you than merely how to reason. <laughs> Jab each other all the time. And then he says this, which I love. Can I quote that part of the letter that refers to the shameful destinations of the press? He's trying to recuperate his image and say the press got him wrong. And Mailer said, oh, they exaggerated their case a little bit, but he's still messed up. He said, can I quote that part about the press? Miller writes back and says no, and when Buckley did write about the Selma incident, which he did about everything, um, he left out Miller's sympathetic words. And, and my favorite part is when that essay was collected in a volume of essays uh, that Buckley had published like every couple of years, he would take all of his columns and things like that and publish it. When that essay was included in the collection, he uh, took a copy of the book and went to the index of the book and went to Norman Mailer's name and he wrote, hi, exclamation point, with a smiley face underneath, because he knew Mailer would go there first <laughs> to see where he was. And sure enough, he wasn't included in the Selma incident. And then Buckley signs his letter, corrigibly, Bill. <laughs> All right, so I beg your forgiveness for telling this sort of long story so quickly off the bat. For me, it was really what started the whole, the whole project. One night, about four or five years ago, I was sitting in bed, reading a magazine, trying to let sleep take me over, and Norman Mailer had died uh, just a few years earlier. 
and he had sold his papers to the Harry Ransom Center down at the University of Texas in Austin um, because he needed the money, and they paid him $2.5 million. So the magazine, once he died, reprinted some of these, these letters, and this was one of the letters. And when I came across this exchange in that magazine, I sat up in bed with a bit of a shock. Uh, here was Norman Mailer, the sort of enfant terrible of the post-war left, writing novels with bad words in them, having graphic, graphic sex scenes in his books in the 40s and 50s, even worse than that, championing socialism. Um, he was sort of the quintessential lefty, you know, an iconoclast, a libertine, the booze, the drugs. He was the husband to six wives and the lover to many, many, many more than that. He once stabbed his second wife with a pen knife, coming just millimeters away from her heart and killing her. And she still didn't divorce him. Uh, well, she did, but it just took her a year before she actually did that. He loved to headbutt people. He was five feet, seven inches tall, with his barrel chest that made him look like a bull ready to gorge someone. He liked to dance along the precipice of good taste and then ask Americans, ask us, why we were so prudish in our attitudes towards life. Now, how could this Norman Mailer be friends with someone like William F. Buckley, who was the enfant terrible of the post-World War II right? He was a traditionalist who loved to sail, and he wore his sailor's cap that he wore all the time with all these pictures. He was the founder of the magazine National Review, which taught, literally taught Ronald Reagan how to be a conservative. Uh, Ronald Reagan would take train trips across the country and he'd read National Review, and that's how he went from being a New Deal Democrat to being a Reagan Republican, I guess. <laughs> Here was Buckley, the host of Firing Line, right? The sort of quintessential patrician, the show that put on weekly display his sort of wicked tongue and his pointed arguments, but also his sort of generous spirit and that vocabulary. I mean, that vocabulary is ridiculous that he had. That's actually probably the single. Uh, most uh, commonly identified characteristic of William F. Buckley is this crazy vocabulary, which he got by trying to impress his dad as a kid. He would show up at the dinner table having learned a new word every single day, and then he would deploy it, trying to win his dad's love, which is kind of sad, too. Um, anyway, here was the crafter of the modern right wing's talking points. Tall, lanky, gracious. How could he be really good friends with Norman? It never really had occurred to me that they would be friends, or that they could be, and yet here was this letter from 1965 showing compassion and humor, kindness and friendship, and what I thought was most distinct was a willingness to teach and be taught. Right? And not only were they friends, but they were, as Mailer put it, debating partners. Right? And so the question, of course, which was obvious to me, and I hope I was right and it turned out I was, is what were they debating? And as I look deeper into their relationships in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when their friendship was at its most fertile, it was clear that they were constantly debating nothing less than the entire future of the United States. What kind of life is it worth living? How could post-World War II Americans, rich and fat, live a more fulfilling life? More fulfilling than that's portrayed in the likes of Leave to Beaver, Fathers Knows Best, those kind of television shows, right? Um, you know, Holden Caulfield might have had an itch, but it was Buckley and Mailer who were eager to scratch it. Right? They were trying to push people forward into a more fulfilling existence. And that's what they were debating. And it was at that moment, after reading some of these letters, that I realized I finally had a potential way to answer the most troubling question of the 1960s. Um, us academics are usually given a hard time for not asking big questions, for focusing in our silos on really small questions that are not really relevant. But um, I was preoccupied by this one sort of big question, which is this. How did the citizens of the richest, most powerful nation that the world has ever known to that point find themselves at such violent odds with one another in the 1960s? How could, how could that happen? Why did it happen? And that's what I set out to answer in this book. Um, it's a big question. And I really wanted to have an answer. And before I found out that my hunch might be right, that these two guys might unlock that big question for me, I had to dig into the archives and learn about the dynamics of this weird friendship. And what I discovered was not only wildly, wildly entertaining, which it absolutely was, but it was also very revealing. It's funny, the, um, the book just got a review about two weeks ago from the Times of London. 
I, as I explained to some of the, the class earlier today. And I think the um, sentence that I appreciated the most, because it was a really great review, Kevin Schultz, it's me, Kevin Schultz evidently had a lot of fun writing this exuberant, intelligent book, and so did I reading it. Right? And while I hope the latter is true, that he enjoyed, well, actually, I don't care, he already wrote a nice thing about it, so it doesn't matter if he enjoyed it or not, but he said he did. Um, and while I hope that is true, uh, for me, it certainly, it certainly was. I did have fun writing it. There's so many stories. These guys were involved in so many of the major events of the 1960s, and they were having a good time doing it. They were going to parties, they were drinking together, they drank a lot together. They were dancing alongside Frank Sinatra and Mia Farrow and Truman Capote and Joan Didion and Gloria Steinem, and I'm not joking, they were literally dancing next to these people at certain parties. Um, they were debating on television one another in large theaters. They could pull 3,500 people into a theater, no problem. Um, and writing about one another in a wicked way that they would do. They wrote about all of the major events of the 60s. The civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the Cold War, Vietnam, the student <coughs> unrest, Barry Goldwater's rise, the new conservatism, the new left. It was all there. And they were sort of, um, they were like Forrest Gump, right? They kept showing up at all these events debating the most important things. I hate that, but... It's a useful analogy. <laughs> so Buckley and Mailer, they, they first meet in 1962, and it was showbiz that brought them together. Mailer was already famous for his 1948 uh, novel, the World War II novel, The Naked and the Dead. And um, many people still think that it's one of the best books to come out of World War II. And it was so popular so quickly that he got his first royalty check. Uh, he was still 25 years old. He got his first royalty check for $40,000. And he went to cash it at his bank in Brooklyn, and they wouldn't let him do it because he looked so disheveled that there's no way this guy could have a check that big. Um, eventually, they called up his publisher, and the manager of the bank had to approve it, and the checks just kept on coming. Right? And then he developed an outspoken left-wing politics uh, that is sort of most typified by his 1959 book, Advertisements for Myself which is a really strange book. It's a collection of all these small articles that he'd written in the first half of his, of, well, up to then, for his whole life. But he, uh, ital he put an introduction and a conclusion to every single piece, and he wrote them in italics. And they described what he was thinking when he wrote this piece, and how he diagnosed the problems in post-war American society. The italics sections are far more interesting than the actual articles that he collected there. And it was in that book that he proposed nothing less than to create a revolution in the era of our time. Right? Holding Caulfield had the scratch, and here's Norman Mailer, one digit. He was, as some people said, a rebel with the cause. Right? And Buckley was already famous when they met, too. He was famous for his 1951 book, God and Man at Yale, which sets the tone of conservatism for the rest of the 20th century by pushing against sort of the nanny state economics um, of the New Deal era. And uh, that's the man part of man at Yale, and also pushing against secular situational ethics that he saw predominant in Ivy League institutions such as this one. And he loved to, to attack the, the people who were uh, advocating this, and we have him to thank for the phrase, the liberal establishment. He hated the liberal establishment, and he's actually the one who coined that phrase. So, early national review. And then I discovered that the parallels between the two men were somewhat shocking. They were both born in the early 1920s. They were both largely shielded from the Great Depression. They both fought in World War II, but on the periphery of action. Both had early fame, as I mentioned. And both even, and the parallels that kept, I kept finding. In 1955, both of them started lasting journals that would sort of mark the politics that was to come. In the fall of 1955, William F. Buckley starts National Review which set the talking points for the conservatives for two decades and is still around, but now it has competition. And three weeks later, Norman Mailer started The Village Voice in New York, which has that sort of cruel, ironic way of looking at the world that characterized so much of the left. They did it within three weeks of one another. In 1962, when they first met, they were still both in their 30s. 
and it was a young producer named John Golden who brought them together, who was also in their 30s. He had read all these books, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. He had read Holden Caulfield. He knew that there was uh, a, a young revolt that was coming up. He saw it happening in the 50s and the early 60s, and he wanted to take someone from the left and someone from the right, and he wanted them to debate the future. So he picked, of course, Naylor and Buckley. He invited them to Chicago to have a debate. And that's the first time they met, and it's where they got 3,500 people, each of whom paid somewhere between 350 and 7 bucks to go see the debate. But of course, Golden, I love Golden, he's hilarious. His name is John Golden, he was born Robert Golden, but he changed his name because he said nobody named Robert ever made it very far in life. <laughs> and the reporter overheard them and said, we should have Robert Graves and Robert Kennedy debate this. <laughs> but he was no dummy. He timed this debate, the buckley Mailer debate, to happen two days before a heavyweight title fight between Sonny Liston and Floyd Patterson. And this was when boxing actually mattered and people paid attention to it. And people were paying attention to this fight. Thousands or hundreds of reporters were showing up to Chicago to watch the fight. There were contest I mean, there were um, uh, audience members were showing up. The fight was a Monday night, so Golden timed his debate to be Saturday before the boxing match. And he rented out a theater, and he changed the marquee, and he just paralleled boxing all the way through. It's Buckley v. Mailer, the undercard to the heavyweight title fight. Right? He sold it as an as a undercard. Um, and sure enough, people came. Uh, the sports reporters were mostly gambling on who was going to win the debate. They had odds two and a half to one favoring Buckley. And to add to this testosterone-filled environment, if you needed it, Mailer even stayed at the Playboy Mansion in Chicago, and I found a great jewel in the archives, which is Hugh Hefner writing to Mailer after he left, saying, I hope you had fun here in Chicago, and judging by the looks of things, you most certainly must have. <laughs> right? So if you can trash the Playboy Mansion, good for you. And the debate didn't disappoint at all. Uh, they were fierce and funny from the very first words. Buckley's opening line was, he didn't think he could maintain Mailer's interest in the right wing, explaining conservative principles, because they didn't have enough sexual neuroses for Norman Mailer. <laughs> but he will try and be interesting enough if Mailer for once would lift his eyes from the world's genital glands. <laughs> That's what he says, right? That's the first line of this debate. They proceeded to argue about almost every major topic in the 1960s in this debate, most especially the Cold War and the civil rights movement that was bubbling up at the time. But the most revealing moment for me happened during the Q&A afterwards. They were each given 30-minute opening statements, and then there was an intermission where some folk singers, the new wine folk singers, tried to entertain this, this hostile environment. And then they came back, and they got 25 minutes to interrogate the other's arguments. Right? What a fantastic debate. Well, Buckley was this famous, famous, skilled debater. He was the, I would say he's among the best to ever, even to this day, come out of Yale. Um, he took the Ivy League debating championship. They actually sent him over to England, and he beat Oxford and Cambridge. He was among the very best debaters. And he was constantly trying to corner Mailer in positions. You said this 12 years ago, and how can you reconcile this with what you said three months ago? It seems like there's a logical error there. And Mailer was increasingly frustrated by this fact that he was trying to corner him in these, in these um, moments. And eventually, you could just see Mailer sort of getting more and more furious by the way that he was responding. And eventually, he just throws his arms up and he says, you want to corner me with your logic? I'm trying to debate the nature of man. Right? I want to understand humankind and how we can live a more fulfilling, authentic life. If you want to win this debate, you can have it. But I'm here to debate the nature of man. Um, at that moment, you can read the transcript. At that moment, it was like, a, I wish it were a cartoon. A little light bulb goes on over Buckley's head. And remarkably for Buckley, he actually cedes the rest of his time to Mailer. And Mailer was frustrated. Said, wait, wait, wait a minute. What are you doing? You can't do this. This is not a Buckley move. You're supposed to keep coming in after me. He said, no, no. I see the rest of my time. Um, when the debate ended, the sports writers all got together and they decided that Mailer had won the debate by a count of six to three to one. So Mailer ends up winning the debate. But then something really revealing happens and very useful for me. A few days later, Buckley calls up Mailer 
and he invites him to his house up in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, they have some business to attend to, so it wasn't just a cold call. Uh, Playboy magazine had bought the rights to the transcription, so um, they wanted to work out the transcription. The, the reviewer for the Times of London said this was probably the last time that an intellectual debate helped sell softcore porn. <laughs> and indeed, it was Playboy's all-time bestseller to that point. Um, and it led to some really funny moments for me in the archives, rolling through the microfilm, you know, trying to see if my college undergraduates are like, this, right? No, I'm reading it for the article, I swear. <laughs> right? um, so they had to work out the transcript for Playboy. But that wasn't Buckley's real motive. They could have done this over phone or with lawyers or anything like that. Um, instead, it was Buckley's efforts to see if he could get to know Norman Mailer, if they could become friends. And he does this after they work out this, this, this um, transcript. He turns to Mailer and says, all right, let's go sail. And Mailer says, what are you talking about? Let's go sail. And so sure enough, they go down to the dock and they go on a three-hour cruise. Right. It was his typical sail from Connecticut south through the Long Island uh, Sound. Then you go east or west, depending on which way the wind is. You go back up, and it's about three hours. And when they got off the sailboat, I'm going to show you what they said. When they got off the sailboat, they were friends. A flurry of letters goes back and forth. Mailer came up with all sorts of nicknames for Buckley's wife. Uh, her name was Pat. She called him, or he called her Slugger all the time uh, because she was. So sort of, she, it, was great, it was very easy for her to come up with really sort of definitive put downs. So he called her Slugger. She called him Chuki Ba Lamb, uh, which was a nickname she picked up from her Scottish nanny. So if you imagine Norman Mailer being called Chuki Ba Lamb, right? They saw each other for dinner here and there. They complained about how hard it was to write important books and articles. They developed a friendship. And I thought, what do these guys have in common? You know, you've got this radical and this conservative, they're up and coming, they're angry, but they should be what we're used to seeing on TV today. They should be just hating each other and writing malicious things about one another. So I thought about this and I found three things. Uh, first, they were both white, Ivy League educated men at a time when it was white, Ivy League educated men who felt comfortable speaking on behalf of the nation. Right? Um, a big change was coming, but it hadn't quite happened yet. This is the power of it. Secondly, they both shared a deep and sincere and genuine love for America, for the country, although they disagreed on what it was that made the United States great. Um, Mailer was on firing line. He called it a searing love of country that he had. Both of them loved the country, but they had problems and they needed to be corrected. And both of them were making an attempt to do that. Uh, thirdly, they shared a mutual hatred, as it would be, for the centrist consensus that held sway in the United States from World War II to the end of the 1960s. As Mailer told Buckley, we both detest the establishment. We don't like the center. That's why we can talk, although we're on opposite sides. So they both were attacking the same enemy. And at the same time, and perhaps a fourth reason that they could be friends, is because both of them really craved the validation that sort of establishment acceptance could bring, the fame, the television entryways, all these kinds of things. They both felt that they deserved it and uh, they could use each other to get there. And so they did. Anyway, at the moment that they met in this night after the 1962 debate and then went sailing in the fall of 62, uh, their stars were on their respective rise, even higher than they had been before. They were both about to join an elite club of extremely articulate public intellectuals that included each other, but also Gore Vidal, Truman Capote, James Baldwin, Susan Sontag. It wasn't a very big group, but there was this group of people who were incredibly articulate, and they were the paramount public intellectuals of the time. Buckley and Mayer were among them. So they were too busy to really establish some kind of friendship, like we would think of it as in the terms of friendship. But a large part of their friendship was public, which was aired in the pages of newspapers or magazines, which is great for a historian. Easy to find, right? And here's where their stories intersect with the life of the nation. Here they are, respectively, debating James Baldwin about the Civil Rights Movement in 64 and 65. Baldwin thought both men got it wrong when it came to black people, but wrong in their own way. Uh, Baldwin constantly called out Mailer for doing what a lot of white liberals 
had done, which was imagine black men as little more than sexualized beings who were closer to the nub of humanity than white people, and thus to be envied and maybe feared a little bit. Um, Baldwin famously wrote an article called The Black Boy Looks at the White Boy, which is Baldwin looking at Mailer, making this claim. Um, at least Baldwin acknowledged Mailer supported the civil rights movement, but still. Buckley, on the other hand, represented a lot of conservatives for Baldwin, and there's this famous, famous 1965 debate at Cambridge, England, between Baldwin and Buckley that you, can, you should watch on YouTube um, you know, after you leave the talk. Um, it's just fantastic. Um, Buckley hates the civil, or opposes the civil rights movement on two grounds. Uh, one, that black people in the South weren't civilized enough to have the vote. They needed to lift themselves up a little more in order to participate in American democracy. To be fair to Buckley, he also thought that uneducated white people shouldn't have the vote. Um, but of course, in reality, there was nobody trying to prevent uneducated white people from voting, and there was a whole social and political structure designed to keep black people from voting. So that was one, the civilization argument. And two, uh, Buckley felt that there might be something wrong with black people, because unlike generations of other immigrant groups, black people had yet to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and succeed in America. And it's called the bootstraps argument. And again, this was willfully blind of the structural inhibitions in residential segregation and access to education, jobs, union advancement, things like that. Things that white folks used from their immigrant origins to succeed in establishing middle class life. Black people didn't have access to this. But Buckley used these two arguments to say, for that reason, the nanny state should stay out of the civil rights movement. Right? Um, only 40 years later would he recant this position. These arguments that I just said are, they were just as ugly sounding in 1965 as they are today, and Baldwin handily won this, this debate in, in Cambridge, England. But here they are within weeks of each other having these debates with James Baldwin about the civil rights movement. And there was more braiding Buckley and Mailer together. In 64, both of them were at the Republican National Convention when Barry Goldwater won, famously won the Republican nomination and he changes the direction of the Republican Party for the rest of the 20th century. Um, and both guys wrote letters back and forth and interpreted what Barry Goldwater's rise meant to their respective sides. <coughs> Buckley worried that Goldwater had come too soon. There weren't enough student advocates to go out and vote for him. He was worried that by, by, by becoming the presidential candidate, he would destroy the conservative movement that Buckley was trying to help build. But Mailer was worried that Goldwater's sort of spitfire ways and his eager tongue to go use nuclear bombs and things like that would lead the nation to rush to the liberal center and embrace Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1964, which is, of course, exactly what happened. Both guys were right. And they were both writing letters about this to each other. And then there's more. In 1965, Buckley runs for mayor of New York City, promising to bring a host of conservative reforms. And Mailer got to cover the campaign for the Village Voice, which prompted great paragraphs like, like this one. No one, I suspect, is more majestically unsuited for here becoming mayor, since it is possible old Bill has never been on a subway in his life. <laughs> Buckley's personality is the highest camp we are ever going to find in a mayorality. No other actor on earth can project simultaneous hints that he's in the act of playing Commodore of the Yacht Club, Joseph Goebbels, Robert Mitchum, Maverick, Savonarola, the nice prep kid next door, and the snows of yesteryear. <laughs> if Buckley didn't talk about politics, if he was just the most camp gun ever to walk into gun smoke, I'd give up Saturday nights to watch him. But he does talk about politics time to time, and his program for New York is to drop an atom bomb post haste on the atom bomb of the Chinese. A man like that cannot be kept from getting an enormous minority vote. <laughs> Which was true. He did get an enormous morning minority vote, won about 14%. But then Mailer has this sentence, which is actually instructive of the whole Buckley campaign. Of course, Buckley's votes will not come from people who even know what the word camp is. No, his sort of votes will come from the kind of girls who want to work at Bell Telephone. By which he meant sort of the angry white working classes. And even though Buckley goes on to lose this election pretty badly, he taught people like, say, Richard Nixon, how to woo the white, angry 
working classes. Buckley, of course, not only loses the election, um, but he steals enough votes from the law and order ethnic Democrat, A. Bean, that Buckley's arch enemy, gosh, he hated John Lindsay. His arch enemy, John Lindsay, becomes mayor. Um, so if liberalism wins in New York City, Richard Nixon learns a lesson and takes it from 1968. And so guess what? Four years later, Norman Mailer decides it's his turn. He's going to run for mayor of New York City in 1969. His main promise was to have the city of New York secede from the state of New York. And if you walk around New York City today, you'll still see buttons that say simply 51, 51st state. Right? Uh, one of his slogans was, throw the bums in. <laughs> he too lost. And guess what? He stole votes from the only other bona fide progressive in the race. And this allowed, wait for it, John Lindsay to get reelected. Right? What else? Uh, they debated Vietnam and the Cold War until they almost got in a fist fight. The one time they almost came to blows was over Vietnam. Mailer was, of course, opposed to the Cold War to the point that he thought the United States should just stop fighting it, should cede ground. He said as much in 1962, and this is well before Vietnam provoked so many Americans to oppose the Cold War. America should not devote its resources, he says, to fighting a battle it cannot win. And even if it does win, it's only going to lead the rest of the world to resent it, because it's going to take so much military effort, it would prevent those nations from ever being free. Which is more or less exactly what happens in Vietnam ten years later. Buckley, on the other hand, thought communism was the work of the Antichrist. Literally, I, you know, this, this staunch cat Catholicism sees um, communism as the work of the Antichrist. And it needed to be checked at every moment. For not only was communism on the march throughout Asia, but it was ready to destroy American democracy. It's already killing the souls and the spirits of the poor saps who are on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The United States should fight, fight, fight until the enemy was dead. And this was actually um, the issue of Vietnam that led Buckley to say that's the problem with, with uh, awful wars, was that they lead to difficult friendships like our own. And that became the subtitle, Difficult Friendship that shaped the 60s. It was supposed to be in quotation marks, but I got it. It didn't happen. <laughs> um, the fist fight happens at Truman Capote's famous black and white ball of 1966. Uh, which was this coming together of the uh, intellectual, political, and economic elite. Truman Capote threw a big party at the Plaza Hotel in New York City to celebrate mostly himself. Um, but everybody was there. This is where they're dancing alongside Frank Sinatra and Mia Farrow and things like that. And uh, at one instance, Mailer, who had a little bit too much to drink, uh, overheard a few people arguing about Vietnam, and he wanted to jump in and tell them they were all getting the whole story wrong. And uh, they pushed him back away and said, go sober up. And he went to the bar instead of sobering up and took a few more drinks. And then he looked and he saw Buckley in the distance. And he walked up to him and said, how could you defend this war? Put up your dukes. And Buckley said, what are you talking about? Right? And he says, put up your dukes. Let's fight. And Buckley looks at him and he sees how drunk he is. And he puts his arm around him called it the playful way in which we used to hate each other on. Alas, they didn't end up getting in a fight. Um, I don't know if it would have been better for my book if they had gotten in a fight or not, <laughs> but I still think it's touching that Buckley turns him down and puts his arm around him and walks him away. And then, of course, both men are at the 1968, the famous, famous 1968 uh, conventions, those marvelous and awful spectacles of democracy at its most dangerous. The Republican convention nominates in Miami. It nominates Richard Nixon, who of course goes on to win the presidency in 68. And Buckley and Mailer run into each other several times at that convention. They both rolled their eyes at the proceedings. They both were really worried about Richard Nixon. Is he a real conservative? Does anybody know what Richard Nixon really wants, what he's going to do? Neither of them had any clue. And they also both recognized that he had a really good chance of winning, too. When uh, Mailer got back to his Brooklyn apartment, uh, he found a letter from Buckley, and it said simply, I shudder at the thought of what you will be writing about that August convention. Right? And Buckley did write a marvelous essay about it. And then they're both famously at the great, awful Chicago convention of 1968, when the Democrats were a total mess, and Mayor Richard Daley promised to keep law and order in his town. 
um, by which he, of course, meant all having all those blue helmeted cops uh, beat up all the protesters who were there to protest the Vietnam War. Um, and the whole thing, of course, as you probably all know, was televised. This is the, as I was talking earlier to the students, this is when there were the split screens on TV. On one side of the screen were all the cops beating up the protesters, and on the other side were the convention leaders trying to nominate a candidate for the Democratic Convention. Um, Richard Daly gets shouted down from the podium in this famous moment, using words that I can't use with this with public access television here. Um, it's a pretty remarkable moment. And Mailer was so uh, frazzled by the events, not only at the convention, but you have to remember in 68, this was also when Martin Luther King is assassinated, and Robert Kennedy is assassinated. All that unrest is really picking up. He actually goes to give a speech, and this is Mailer, give a speech to all the students, because he's with them, right? And he looks at all the National Guardsmen who have been called out to keep order, and he's not sure who he wants to sympathize right, with. Does he want to sympathize with the students who seem to be aimless and protesting for no good reason? Does he want to sympathize with the National Guard who's beating up students for no good reason? And so he actually does this. He has the, uh, the speakers turned to the police, and he gives a short speech saying how much he sympathizes with them and how he understands their conflict, and he doesn't think they're evil people, but they need to be aware that they will be held responsible for their actions. And then he turns the speakers towards the crowd, and he says he sympathizes with them, and he understands where they're coming from, but they need to understand that they will be held responsible for their actions. He's sort of split. And then Mailer being Mailer, a, a, a kid in the front row who's there protesting, a protester, a young protester as he's called, says, write good about this, baby, write good. And at that moment, Mailer says, all right, I'm with you guys. Right? He's a normal Mailer after all. Um, but still, the sort of violent birthing pains of the new order were almost too much for him to figure out. And Buckley, of course, was so frazzled by the events of Chicago in 1968 that he famously lost his temper on ABC television. This is when he was brought in to debate Gore Vidal, and Gore Vidal called him a crypto-Nazi on live TV. And um, Buckley said, now listen, you got me queer. If you call me a crypto-Nazi again, I'll punch you in the nose so far that your nose will get stuck. You know, he's got this whole, and this is on live TV, right? <laughs> Um, there's a documentary out right now that just went on a wide release called Best of Enemies, and it details this exact moment. It's a really good documentary, and it details this exact uh, 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 debate. And afterwards, Buckley slunk away. You know, this isn't the Buckley way. Buckley is going to beat you with his arguments, not sit there and call you names. Right? And Buckley slunk away, and he felt terrible about this event for the rest of his life. Uh, he sued Vidal, and Vidal sued him, and there was all this sort of litigiousness that went on. But he realized that something had pushed him over the level where he wanted to comfortably debate the life of the nation. And so by the 1970s, both Buckley and Mailer are no longer quite so central to the Times. They still wrote best-selling books and, and articles. Uh, Executioner's Song by Mailer is one of my favorite books. It comes out in 1979. But it's no longer about the life of the nation, necessarily. It's about a small murder that takes place in rural Utah. And he's no longer the voice of the people. And they're seen much more in the 70s and 80s as symbols, rather than vibrant players that people need to read. They had helped set things on course, but then the time seemed to pass them by. One of my favorite examples of this, uh, one of my favorite finds in the archives, was, um, it actually didn't come from the archives, but from eBay, of all places. I have. Mailer and Buckley set on a Google alert, so every time something happens. So on eBay, I found this, this thing for sale. In 1971, this toy company decided that it was going to make a lot of money by developing a deck of playing cards. Um, it's called Politicards, and they were going to be all the po political uh, players in the 1972 election. So there's Richard Nixon, he's the king of spades, wearing a royal red robe with a crown and a staff and nothing else. Uh, Pat Nixon, you know, she's sort of got this angular, sharp personality that people knew her for, and that's exactly how she looks as the queen of spades. Spiro Agnew, the vice president, he was the jack, ready to beat up any Democrat who went to. There's Ronald Reagan is in this, stomping on a hippie. Uh, Ralph Nader is fixing a car. They're really funny pictures. And in this deck of cards from 1971, so conveniently for me, there were two jokers, Norman Mailer and William F. Buckley, right? And that actually became the cover of the book. 
This is, this is Mailer as Joker, and this is Buckley as Joker. Um, and I actually got to use the cards as the front piece. So here you can actually see the Joker, the Joker, the Joker pieces as the front piece. And it signified to me that this is not the King of Hearts or anything like that. They're Jokers. Right? And here's a better example, even better example, of these guys sort of no longer being quite so central to the times in the 70s. Um, in 1976, Right? So this is 14 years after they met at that famous 1962 debate. In 1976, during the presidential election between Ford and Carter, Good Morning America calls up Buckley, the television show Good Morning America calls up Buckley, and asks him, would you like to debate Norman Mailer on our show? And you can just imagine Buckley thinking back to that 1962 debate when for two and a half hours they could captivate the nation, and it was transcribed in Playboy, right? Um, and he thought, this, maybe we're back, right? And then he asked the producers, how long do we get to debate each other? Six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, Buckley says, no, I'm not going out there for six minutes. And they said, what, why not? Because in six minutes you can't say anything. We had two and a half hours 14 years ago, now we get six minutes. And so there's some rustling on the other line, and the producers are talking to each other. Says, Will you come and do it for 11? And they say, sure, 11 minutes, okay. All right. So sure enough, on November 2nd, 1976, Buckley and Mailer debate each other on Good Morning America. Nobody really cares. They don't change each other's minds. Uh, they don't change anybody's minds. This thing was very hard to find anywhere in the archives. And in fact, the most interesting thing that happened in the debate happened after the debate. They went downstairs, and Buckley is putting Mailer in a taxi cab to go back home. And they're standing on the sidewalk in New York, and they see a Volvo station wagon on the street, and it's going a little too fast. And all of a sudden, it looks like it's aiming straight for them, and it's coming closer and closer and closer. And both of them are about to jump out of the way, and all of a sudden, it slams on the brakes and pulls over right where they are, and then the window rolls down, and it's Daniel Patrick Moynihan, <laughs> who on that day was elected to the Senate from New York. And he rolls down the window, and he says, Damn, I could have got you both with one swipe. <laughs> so piecing all this together, braiding together these interwoven biographies, the remarkable overlaps, the joyful debates, the humorous letters that I found in the archives, the common causes that they had, and the vicious fights and where they opposed each other, all of this was how I came to find the answer to the big question that I had been after from the very beginning. And the big question, just to remind you all, was this. How did the citizens of the richest, sort of most powerful nation um, in the world find themselves at such violent odds with one another? Right? So what's the answer? So the era has almost become mythologized in our history. I mean, we see Mad Men, and we see Selma, and we see all these 50th anniversary celebrations because um, the 1960s were 50 years ago, and there are going to be a ton more 50th anniversary celebrations. Just wait, it's going to get really old by 1968, 69. I mean, by 2018, 2019. And it occurred to me that really the bottom line, when it came down to it, what Buckley and Miller were debating, and in turn, what the key theme of the whole decade was, was freedom. That's the key word. So um, if Mad Men is to be trusted, just to come back to the title of the lecture. Um, that's the key theme in Don Draper's life, for those of you who have seen it, right? How much freedom can you possess? Can you be free from your history? Can you be free from your family? Can you be free from your spouse? Right? That was his quest throughout, was to, to ponder the, the meanings and limits of freedom. Or if you think of Selma, for instance, to keep up this sort of analogy, that was a freedom march that was done in the name of the freedom movement. Right? If you look at the rise of the new right, they're trying to promote free enterprise in the land of the free. Right? Well, in the 1960s, with times being good, both the right and the left, as symbolized by Buckley and Mailer, both the right and the left demanded more freedom. Mailer's freedom was much of that of the rest of the left. Freedom of speech, freedom of social expectations. He was born in the Jewish middle class in Brooklyn and he saw all that immigration, uh, immigrant aspiration around him. The definition of a good life was to land a steady job and be able to hold an apartment, right? He saw that aspirational longings. His mom was particularly invested in this and he didn't want any of that, right? He thought it was ultimately unfulfilling to demand the picket fence and the pension and the corporate job 
He wanted to be freer than that. He wanted an intellectual and cultural kind of freedom. One where free expression was valued and the individual was able to express himself or herself, that would, they would act herself later, but himself uh, without any repercussions. And this is why his novels used bad words. Right? Um, he, of course, wasn't allowed to spell those bad words. So in the first book, the, the, the F-U-G is used all the time in the first book. But he's trying to say, this is how people really talk. And as a culture, we need to honor that. Uh, there was a great rock and roll band called The Bugs, <coughs> named after that by the That's why he's constantly challenging sexual mores. He wants to be free from the pretension in order to allow us, Americans, to live a more authentic life closer to our real needs and our real wants, right? But Buckley's cause was also freedom. Not about freedom from the aspirational picket fences or from the authentic experience, whatever that might be. He wanted freedom from the state telling him what to do. He wanted freedom from high taxes limiting how he can express himself. He wanted freedom from the liberal assumptions that guided American life in the post-war world. He most especially did not want the government saying what the good life was. Right? And it makes sense a little bit if you think about his background. He was born really wealthy in a house that had a name, Great Elm. There were 114 rooms at this house, uh, six pianos, imagine six pianos, uh, private tutors flown in from all over the world. And I guess technically a conservative should have something that they really want to conserve. And Buckley wanted to conserve that kind of life. And over the course of the 1960s, what these two guys narrated, what they wrote about, what they participated in, was a constant debate about freedom. They both knew that they wanted more freedom than the middle was then granting them, but they were constantly debating which freedoms needed to be honored and what the cost of those freedoms might be. How could free Americans be most free? Right? What was limiting it? And the question that they find out too late, I would say, is what are the costs of asking for freedom? What happens to the common wheel if we all want to be free to do our own thing? Does the common wheel risk being destroyed? And that's how I came to answer my big question, which is sort of the thesis of the book buried underneath all these marvelous stories. For the story is not just a strained romance between two guys. A lot of the reviews of the book have said, but you know, this isn't as good of a bromance as we've seen on movies and television and stuff like that. Um, but they're missing the point, because the book is more than just a strained friendship. But it's also an argument that the best way to understand what happened in the 1960s, why there was so much radical change that happened so quickly, is to see both the left and the right turning against the middle, attacking it from their flanks, marshalling troops, and using the language of freedom on their side. And with hardly anyone defending the center, cracks began to appear in how people understood the country and how they understood what it was intended to be, about how they understood the American social contract or the American way of life. Right? People began to understand calls, of course, for increased freedoms from both the left and the right. And indeed, Mailer was right when he demanded a revolution in our time. But his, the revolution that came was one from the left and the right. And both were demanding freedom. And freedom, have I said it enough now? Freedom is a powerful word in American political life. Who's going to be against freedom in our country? Right? It's, it's hard to argue against. People do it all the time, say they were part of society, all these kinds of things. And it, it, it certainly hasn't carried weight in the last 40 years. Um, maybe that'll change. But without any center, with the left and the right both agreeing on the need for more freedom, the country lurches around. And violence was perhaps inevitable. It was striking to me that both Mailer and Buckley used the same metaphor to describe what happened. And it was the birthing pangs of a new order, where the social contract was changing. Buckley wants to midwife. This is his language, right? Think of it. They're using this language about what's happening in the 1960s. Buckley wants to midwife the revolution. And Mailer sort of sees the country as heavy with birth, uncertain what's going to happen, and just hopeful that it doesn't all turn in on itself. And for a little while, that's exactly what happened. After all, one man's freedom is a threat to another man's livelihood, his self-respect, his self-understanding, things like that. And as both Buckley and Mailer realized too late, 
there is a cost to freedom, and it's paid in the name of the common good. And so when the justifications for a common good slip away, the set of assumptions that Americans live by changes. Instead of sort of corporate capitalism with its high taxes, we end up with what we have today, which is laissez-faire capitalism, with people demanding low taxes and freedom in the, in, from the nanny state. Um, the Tea Party, of course, today's Tea Party, is an extension of that kind of argument. Um, instead of honoring tradition, we search for different traditions today. One that will honor our vision of pluralism and multiculturalism and still yet hold us together. And I think we're still looking for that. Instead of obeying a certain set of rules about how you should wear your hair, about the kind of clothes you should wear, about how high your skirt had to be above your knee, we all live with the sense that we can and should, in the language of the 1960s, do your own thing. All right? Um, and that's actually a phrase both Buckley and Mailer really began to attest. Do your own thing. They called it the do your own thingism of the late 1960s and early 70s. And both of them hated that phrase. So these things, you know, the, the kind of capitalism advocated in Lazy Fair, they're both good and bad. They're not good or bad per se in some ways, but they do have meanings and they do have consequences. And the society that was created in the aftermath of the 1960s and the 1970s, 80s, 90s is the society that we live in today, with the right and the left still polarized, with everybody hating the middle, with everyone making demands in the name of the freedom, and us struggling to come up with language that might be able to counter that of freedom. And, Mailer once, and what Mailer once called the searing love of country that they both these guys had grew increasingly complicated by history and follow. And, follow. and now I would argue, we live in an age of irony and anger, um, which were the two extremes of what Buckley and Mailer projected, but absent any concern for the common good. Um, in, in some, they more than likely helped bring about a society that they came to despise even more than the one they wanted to change. And through it all, in the 70s and 80s, these two guys remained friends. In, early 19, in the early 1970s, Playboy, Playboy's everywhere, Playboy asked Buckley, who do you feel inferior to? And Buckley waffled around in his answer, you know, thousands of people, and he said, come on, just give us a name, give us a name. And eventually Buckley says, Mailer, after all, he's a genius, and I'm not. Of course, he's ruined more people's lives than I have, <laughs> but he's a genius. And Mailer returned the favor. Uh, in 1975, again, one of my favorite finds in the archives, in 1975, a charitable group auctions off an evening with William F. Buckley, right, can you imagine? Um, and he asked Mailer if he would do the auction. So Mailer says, of course, and I found this in the archives. He goes full to Buckley, right? Mailer stands up at the auction and he says, here to auction off an hour with that intellectual inchling that pride of conservatism irrumpent, if not always ideologically arrogate. I, he's using all these famous Buckley vocabulary words, right? <laughs> I am happy to say that the successful bidder will receive a full hour of conversation and attention from Sharon Connecticut's own Buckeen, William F. Buckley, right in his New York home among his lairs and penitents. At any rate, we must breathe deeply, avoid the ganch and garleon, and prepare to bid up our wallets for the right to be received by that scolorotical exponent of holophoresis, the natural practitioner of misophony and misocania, that sedulous seek sorrow of the CIA, now rendered semi-ustillate, I fear by the likes of Spiro Agnew, but nonetheless phenomenally well worth bidding up if you have a taste for tongue tallying with America's own septiternial columnist that upper yahoo from Yale, Mr. William F. Buckley and his gang of Trillabots. <laughs> um, after the auction, Mailer sends a clean copy of this to Buckley, and he says, Dear Bill, yours to frame or flip away. And Buckley responds pretty quickly, Dear Norman, thanks a million for the text of the introduction, which I shall attempt to decipher as soon as I find myself next to a substantial dictionary. I have not yet met the highest bidder, but I shall attempt to sound as you would have me sound. Let's meet soon, as ever. Bill. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to 
to answer questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm here for however long. Do you see any parallels today on the political scene? <laughs> yeah, I get asked this question quite a bit. Um, I would. I mean, I can come up with a few people, but nobody is close. I mean, I think the kind of discussion that you might see would be John Stewart, the sort of lefty Jew, and uh, Bill O'Reilly, the conservative Catholic. But if you look at the conversations that those two men have compared to the kinds of conversations that these two guys had, and they're just far inferior. Yeah. You think about um, David Brooks and um, he said across the news hour. Shields. Yeah, Shields. They actually have some conversation back and forth, but it always seems to go by in five minutes, which is exactly how much time they're given. Uh, no, I don't. I think that our intellectual life has changed. Um, I think this is a good thing and a bad thing, actually. I think the reason it's changed is um, partly because in Buckley and Mailer's time, there were three networks. Everybody watched the same television programs. The country was you know, overwhelmingly run by the power elite, by white, Ivy League educated men. Um, now we have, what, 150 channels that we can turn on. We mostly want to hear our own politics, our own perspective, so we'll turn on Fox News if we're conservative, or MSNBC if we're liberal, or CNN if we're stuck at the airport. Um, you know, and on the internet it's even worse. You can just go and find our own voices, people telling us things that we already want to hear. So I think you know, the forces of communications and capitalism have really broadened the number of outlets we have. So I think sort of having this small group of public intellectuals teach us about ourselves, that year has passed. So partly it's because of this communications revolution, but also I think um, there's something that's better going on, and it's that one of the calls of the 1960s was to broaden the table of who gets included. right? African Americans, uh, women, homosexuals, uh, all these voices, Native American, Asian American, all these voices were underrepresented to say the least in the power structures of post-World War II America. And one of the revolutions of the 1960s was broadening that. We need to have a bigger table. We need to invite these voices. And I think, you know, when you look at a time when Mailer and Buckley were these white Ivy League educated men sitting next to other white Ivy League educated men pretending that they could speak on behalf of the nation, that is gone. And I think the challenge for us today, as I was talking to the class earlier, the challenge especially for them, but for us today, is to figure out how we can be inclusive of all those voices and yet speak about what's good for the common wheel. Instead of speaking about what's good for me or what's speaking on what's behalf of what's good for my people, whoever those people might be. Right? I don't think that, I think you know, there's the same level of IQ is available to us now that we have been, the structures have changed. Yeah. yeah I, I'm fascinated. I, mean, I was a young junior high, high school kid, and grew up in North Jersey, working class background. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fascinated with Buckley. He was on the, you know, the firing line. He even got things. And I was thinking for Democratic and progressive, but. Uh, People can't really, you know, just brought back memories. I remember getting a pocket dictionary and trying to put it. Right. <laughs> it's just not talking about it. Exactly. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I noticed that here is this intellectual a vocabulary which is, you know, just knocked the socks off you. But how ignorant he was of life. Especially when you talk about the civil rights. Yeah. I don't think the guy had a clue about slavery. He didn't know what a working person, you know, I grew up at the Ford Foundry down the street and the foundry there. He had no clue. And that's why when he was in New York, I mean, he had no clue about life. I think when Bush, remember years ago, when Bush asked how much, was asked how much did a gallon of milk cost, and he had no clue. Right. Buckley. And, and Mailer, I think at the end, they became like celebrities and entertainers. Right. And there were kids in my neighborhood who were going to Vietnam. Dying and wounded and things like that. And it became a joke for so many of us. And we were some of us lucky to go to college. And we sort of got on, like Bruce Springsteen, 
Bruce Springsteen said once, you know, don't get caught on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us tried to make sure we got on the other side so we didn't have to die, didn't have to bleed, yeah. you know, stay away from the riots. And I, that's what it became, and that's what I see more and more today, is it's a show. Mm -hmm. Like, tonight we'll be the clown car. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's that. But, I mean, there's the old line about public intellectuals that the more you are of one, the less you are of the other. The more public you are, the less intellectual you are. The more intellectual you are, the less public you are. And I think these two guys crave that public side, um, and yet they didn't want to play the role that they were being cast as. And they struggled and fought against it. Uh, when Buckley sued Vidal, some of his friends said, don't sue him. By showing up on ABC television for 10 times during the conventions, you signed a contract. You are now playing the role of Bill Buckley the conservative. You are not Bill Buckley the conservative. You're playing the role and you're opening yourself up to being part of the show and being called an anti-Semite or homosexual. And you, that's part of what you've signed on for. And it, you say that Buckley didn't have a clue. Um, that really shocked him. Oh, wait, what do you mean I signed up for this? But he did. Um, one of the things that Mailer was trying to constantly teach Buckley was that this conservative politics was a rich person's politics. And there are all these working class kids who um, you know, didn't know what it was like to be raised in a house with 114 rooms and six people. Right? And so for him to advocate these kinds of policies to fight for that kind of conservatism was to perpetuate that kind of conservatism, which you know, only the 1% can have. And what was so striking to Mailer was that when Buckley ran for election in 1965, the people who loved Buckley's anger was not the one percenters, but it was the working class cops who came across the street. I mean, there's stories of, of, the, of cops sitting there wearing Buckley buttons in their police uniforms. Um, you know, there's a great line, we thought we were going to get the sort of upwardly mobile dentists on our side, and instead we got these working class people that Buckley didn't even know how to talk to. But they were the people who kept crossing the street to shake his hand, saying, I hope you go get those liberals. Right? So Mailer was struck by the fact that here's this guy who's never been on a subway in his life, and yet, and yet, right, he's tapping into this anger. Yeah? Um, fascinating, thank you. I was hoping you could maybe just talk a little bit about how you think, uh, what the legacy of both of these figures is in their respective political corners today. And my sense is that both of them were somehow dated. Um, definitely, I think modern day progressivism would not look to someone like Mailer for inspiration today. And even on the conservative side, Buckley, I feel like now conservatives today will probably read Hayek or Friedman, but not necessarily Buckley. Yeah. And do you share that sense? And what do you what do you think why that is? Um, I think I sort of share that sense. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, that both of these guys won some things in the 1960s and lost some things in the 1960s. I mean, I kind of wrote this book because these guys were so big and important and larger than life at the time, and they were slipping so quickly from historical memory. And it, 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 why were these figures so important? What did they say that drew people to them? Or how did they say it? What kind of style did they bring about? So yeah, I think they are slipping from our historical view, and that was part of the reason I wrote the book was to sort of revive them and try and remember this time. Um, I think that the movements that they helped set in motion went in directions that they didn't foresee, which is which happens to everybody, right? I think Mailer absolutely won some of the cultural arguments of the 1960s. I mean, if you watch a commercial on television right now, you're going to hear bad words and see more flesh than you would have seen in the 1950s. Um, the laws against using foul language in books, much less magazines, forget about it. I mean, that kind of proximity to the, the, the opening up of the avenues for us to explore human sensibilities, including sex, far greater than when Mailer wrote, and these were the things that he was absolutely demanding and advocating. Right? He won. Especially when you look at what a traditionalist like Buckley was saying. This is all in bad taste. We should outlaw this. Well, come on. On the other side, if you look at the kind of economics we have today, with an increasingly low tax structure and um, you know, more laissez-faire sensibility, 
That was Buck these were Buckley's arguments. So Buckley kind of won. He set the talking points. He brought Hayek to the readers of the National Review and introduced them to the ideas that Hayek and Friedman were putting forward, right? Out of the academic departments into the hands of Ronald Reagan, who's writing the train reading the National Review. So even though these two guys have faded from view, I think some of the movements that they pushed into motion, we still live with today, absolutely. I, uh, total counterfactual, which is what we're historians are not supposed to do. It always strikes me, I wonder if Mailer had won the economic argument and we had a greater socialized sense of belonging, and Buckley had won the cultural argument and we had a more traditional sense of you know, how high your dress had to be and stuff like that. It would be a completely different, maybe better America. Um, but that's not how it turned out. And why? Because of the word freedom. Because of the word freedom. Um, so yeah, I mean, that really got, because I knew of these guys sort of. And I really wanted to know, why were they so important? And that's, so yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, so just for reading it, I mean, I, I like the way you set it up on this almost openness to the other side. But I have to say, from reading it, Mailer seems a lot more open mm -hmm. to exposure than Buckley. Buckley feels, seems very close to me from, uh, and I mean, some of it's the playful snarkiness of the way he writes, but just generally, you know, from the very beginning, even some of the, you know, the materials you quote from him in college, I mean, he just seems like he knows everything he needs to know, and, and so there's not this kind of willingness, there's not a reciprocal willingness to learn, and the, the letter that you began with, with Mailer expressing that in our heart of hearts, we actually probably have something to talk about, I don't get that from Buckley from that. And Buckley, you know, Andrew Sullivan famously sort of talking about epistemic closure or whatever, but Buckley strikes me as a little bit closed off. No, you're absolutely right that Mailer was far more open to this than Buckley was, um, far more willing to accept error than Buckley was, and um, far more pliable, I guess, in what he thought good ideas could be than Buckley ever was. Um, so I see you some of that claim. But... Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, if you watch old episodes of Firing Line, mm -hmm. so Firing Line, for those of you who don't know, was the longest running single anchor television show in television history. It ran from 1966 to 1999, all of Buckley as host. And all it was was two chairs, sometimes three chairs, a table, and Buckley with his clipboard, right? And he had this way about him, and he would ask questions. And the whole idea was to bring people who opposed him mostly, lefties, and they would spend an hour, no commercials because it's all on public television, um, debating each other. And maybe we're so far removed from this kind of intellectual environment, but when I would see uh, someone like Stokely Carmichael or Huey Newton, you know, when I'd see a Black Panther stand up and say, Mr. Buckley, I'm going to ask you some questions for the next half an hour. And Buckley said, all right, and then answer questions about what a conservative believes. I feel like there was this general willingness to engage. There was a playfulness um, that I think is absent today. Um, so I, I took that to be you know, a willingness to engage. Does he have all the answers? I think he would obviously say no, he doesn't have all the answers. But I think where the difference would be is that Buckley had foundations. Christianity, a certain understanding of capitalism, a certain relationship to other people in this world. He had stern foundations that have um, anchors. And Mailer was searching for those. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that has something to do with the willingness mm -hmm. to be right or to be wrong. Um, and in the archives, and I say this in the book a couple times, Mailer constantly tells Buckley, let's learn from each other. And Buckley only rarely takes him up on it. Mm -hmm. so that's absolutely, and maybe that has something to do with the nature of what it means to be a conservative, a conservative. You need to have these solid anchors. Maybe that's an overstatement. That's not, that doesn't come up in the book. Whereas to be someone who's more liberal invites you to have a more uh, open willingness to engage, tolerate error as a captain. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, there was a really good editorial in the Sunday New York Times by Frank Bruton about we invited Donald Trump to town. He was going back to a kind of genealogy of how American politics has turned into show business, mm -hmm. including the most zany, ridiculous stuff that you can pull forward. I guess Rand Paul just said, well, let's 
hope we stop short of self-immolation on the front of the camera. So, you know, things have progressed. Although that might not be such a good memory. Let's not rule it out. Yeah, we're just really in the collecting cycle. But my question concerns the public mind or the public, the American public, the electorate, the TV audience, whatever, perception of the difference or the problem of style and substance in political issues. Mm -hmm. And it does seem to me a line has been crossed. And I would say that Buckley and Mailer started the process. Because Bruni said, was it when Marilyn Monroe sang happy birthday to John Kennedy? Or was it when, and then he had about five or six, like the, the attempt by the sober, the sober leadership to introduce an element of good humor and camera, or I don't know, fun. So yeah. Fun. So the, the reconciliation of fun with seriousness, fun is sort of style, seriousness may be more substance, but it does seem to me there's really there really is a problem going on here because you said they Buckley and Mailer got together in show business with the fight, the heavyweight, number one. And it's like Americans want to hear about number one. Number one in every category. And actually really substantive issues don't have anything number one. Maybe say, who's talking about number one? Who's becoming number one by talking about being number one? But these issues aren't about number one. And isn't there a kind of displacement of substance by style in our political life that's built into the media and the whole show business thing? So, I mean, obviously, yes. I would hesitate to glorify the past. I mean, you think about Andrew Jackson, you know, inviting all of his buddies to open up kegs in the White House. Um, you know, that's all show, and John Quincy Adams had all the but, right answers. But, you but so there's this sort of, um, but you, there's, this, there's this aspect where democratic politics require a sense of show business. But you mentioned Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. Now, there's a contrast. That's a real substantive contrast, and it's kind of dull. And, I mean, this look is actually... It was a real contest. That was a real moment. Mm -hmm. And I sort of feel like the Mailer, Mailer, uh, Buckley, and you could go down the line. It's like these are codependent, symbiotic court jesters that need each other because the media is there. And by God, we love to have a gladiatorial. And one is polysyllabic, and the other one is four letter words. Mm -hmm. Boy, we'd like to see that. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. I don't know where the line has been crossed, um, or if the line has been crossed. Um, we have a pretty well-educated president today, I would say, who knows Reinhold Niebuhr, and who knows you know, philosophy and theology, but he also can sing Amazing Grace when it's called upon, and do a damn fine job of that as well. Um, you know, there's a strong sense that democratic politics require anti-intellectualism. Richard Hofstadter's great book on this, The Intellectualism in American Life. And I think that that has always been a part of us, and it's just a nature of the medium changing. And when the medium changes, we now have eight minute attention spans because television has taught us to have eight minute attention spans before the next commercial, as opposed to the like, Lincoln Douglas debates where people are sitting around for two hours listening. Um, so I think the medium has changed, and our public intellectuals and our politicians have changed with it. Um, are we worse off? Probably. Um, do I wish we had longer attention spans to sustain ourselves? Yes, I absolutely do. But it's funny to go back and look at old episodes of Firing Line and see that level of conversation, you know, bringing out the most famous politicians and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I just don't know what the answer is. I wish I did. Then I would have written a different book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody want to hand up right in the middle? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I agree with what the, the last gentleman said. And, and what struck me from um, the beginning with both Conway and Mailer was that, um, that I didn't find their, their friendship and strange because they were both provocateurs, mm -hmm. deliberate provocateurs, at least in public discourse. Both who had a genius for self-promotion, yeah. um, as you say, you know the structures have changed and everything else, but they, in some ways, accelerated the trend on, on both elected 
Um, and I think we're, we're headed towards that great wonderful day that H.L. Lincoln predicted, I think, back in 1920, when he was deploring what passed for public discourse in the presidential election. He said, I look forward to that great kind of coming day, which will probably come soon, when the way public discourse is and, and on political issues is debated in American life, we will arrive at the millennium and we will elect a complete and utter moron as president of the United States. Some might say we already have. <laughs> I'm not naming names. Um, we'll see. You know, um, we'll see. I, I, I don't know where the next digital technological revolution will lead us. Uh, I can't say what it'll bring out. You know, the Donald Trump, people laugh at him, but he's got somewhere between four and ten billion dollars to spend on this campaign. And he's not doing it for um, the ability to charge ten thousand dollars to go give a public talk at forty thousand or fifty thousand or whatever it is. He doesn't need to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean I think democracy I would also say that democracy is more at risk at the fact that this has become a sideshow and it's allowed the extreme capitalists to start buying politicians. That's not new in American life either. But I think that, especially in the aftermath of a decision like Citizens United, that we risk having this transformation as well. Um, the story in today's paper, history's paper, was the Koch brothers who are not just wanting to spend their own money, but they're trying to create a super PAC of their five richest friends so that they can have $100 billion. Or, that can't be right, can it? No, of course. Some ridiculous amount of money. So they'll end up spending as much money as both of the parties. What kind of democracy is that? Uh, I guess we are a republic, not a democracy. So. Um, Just as an aside, isn't it Jim Buckley? William Buckley's brother, when he was a senator in New York, he's the one that pushed that whole concept of money. His speech. He. He passed. He, there was. A, yeah, I, I don't know the exact law, but that was part right. of it. There's a great the Buckley amendment. It was the Buckley Amendment. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Um, so, great... <laughs> William Buckley. On the other hand, William Buckley was. Um, he took the Conservative Party from the 1940s and 50s and he kicked out a lot of the extremists. Ayn Rand was summarily kicked out of the Republican Party, well, the Conservative movement, let's put it that way. All the John Birchers were kicked out from seeing conspiracy theories everywhere. Buckley knew he had to. Rid, he called them the kooks. We have to rid us, ourselves of the crazies, of the kooks, in order to be a sustainable party that can present a respectable face to the American population. Um, and the Koch brothers' dad was one of the founding members of the John Burr Society. And so it, it all does tie together in there. The, so, so after Bill Buckley runs for mayor, they want him to run for Senate uh, in 1970. And he doesn't want to do it because he's got his media empire to run. He doesn't need to have more of a megaphone. And so they convince Buckley's brother, Jim, to run, and he wins. And Bill Buckley is happy for his brother, but also a little bit jealous and frustrated. And there's this moment where um, Jim Buckley says in his victory speech, I am the new politics. I am the voice of this new conservatism that's on the rise. Right? And off stage, Buckley says to his sister in French, he says, I goddamn well am the new politics. No? <laughs> he said in French. Oh, sorry. Um, it wasn't me, I was quoting the source. 